Hey, Shalom, Shalom, Israel. This is your teacher, Eric. Go ahead and give me some feedback and let me know how I'm coming in. I rebuke Satan in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, that there'll be no interference. I know he was trying to cause a little bit of trouble, and the saints are saying, I've got a 10, so look at that. Yeshua comes in with the win again. Hey, love you all. Uh, I do want to just start out and say what a tremendously blessed message from Teacher Shane on Shabbat. Was that not fire in the bones preaching by our beloved Teacher Shane? That was truly a blessing. And I really enjoyed how he said that the Psalms, there are warfare prayers. The Psalms are warfare prayers. There is so much in the Psalms that you can glean from that it just shows you the, the reality of what David went through. And, and Brother Ugly says, Pastor Corey too. You know Pastor Corey is always bringing it. Bless, bless, bless you. But I want to focus on something here because David, when you read this, you know, you have a man after Yahweh's own heart. And we look at him when we put him up on this pedestal, like we do a lot of times with the saints when we're reading the Bible, and we forget they went through the same things that we go through today. They experience the same thoughts, feelings, and emotions that we feel. And when we read those Psalms, we see David's heartache through many things, like with he had enemies coming up on him and they seem to always gain some ground at times. And he's asking, Yah, Yahweh, they hate you. They despise you. Why does it seem like they are being blessed? Why does it seem like they are not being stricken down, Yah? Rain down fire on them. And, and don't you feel like that some days? You know, that, that you have the enemy rising up on you. And you're thinking, why are these people out there that aren't serving Yah? And it seems like they are blessed. And you ask, why, Yah, why would they be blessed and they don't even keep your commandments? What about me? And especially if it, things don't go in your life the way that you think that they ought to, because you think that, that Yah should perform according to your mindset, and that's just not the way that he does. And so when I read those Psalms, I'm like, wow, what David's writing about is exactly what I feel and what has happened to me. And then when David would see the enemy fall, and he would glorify the Father for being victorious. It, it just speaks to me and resonates with me. What about when David had problems in his own family? Don't we see that? We, want, we have a family that we're raised into the commandments. And I'm not just talking even about your natural family, but your spiritual family, the family on your lands that live with you, your communities. And you think, geez, we got together over the book, why won't we just obey it? Why can't we all just get along and serve the king? Why are we having these little hiccups here and there? Why do we have people turn on us and slay us with their tongue when we thought they were our brother and sister? Why do we got these spots at the love feast when I thought we we're supposed to come together in perfect harmony? Well, David experienced all these things, same things too, and we can see how he overcame. And it's all written in his psalms and how he always went back and cleaved to the commandments he never lost faith even when all these enemies came up against him even when his own children tried to overthrow him even when people like saul turns on him and tries to murder him even when his son dies and he's convicted through the prophet through his sin he always holds on to his faith in yah we need to be like David. You need to go back, and you guys, y'all, you need to read those Psalms again. I know a lot of you have spent time in them, but read them again. And, and just think how you can relate to them and the realness that, that is in them. Hey, Shalom, Shalom. I see the saints saying Shalom on here. Bless you. Love you all. I'm so glad that you're taking the time to tune in. Again, like I always say, if you're working, keep after it. Just turn it up so everybody can hear and if you got time to kick back and relax, we'll do that too. And what we're going to talk about today is the phrase, and I heard one time this, he was a speaker, it came to a, a deal, and he said, I got Jesus who you got. And that was his motto. And it really stuck with me, and it really resonated in, into my heart and my soul. You know, we got Jesus. That's who's going to get us through. 
Who does the world got? Because everything that they think they have will all come to nothing. Whether it's their doctors, whether it's their bankers, whether it's their families or wherever they find their support. Anything that they put ahead of Yahweh is going to fail at some point and at some time. It's going to come to naught. And we have to realize that in us, we have Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, who will never fail, who will never let us down, who will never leave or forsake us. Isn't that something just to be proud about? Isn't that something that we should be happy about? Isn't that a little something that you can shout amen to the rooftops about? Well, that's something that I can get excited about. So let's get right into it. Luke chapter 1, verse 37 says, For Elohim, for with Elohim, nothing shall be impossible. Now, do you believe that? With Elohim, nothing shall be impossible. Now, see, other translations, they read as, for no word from Elohim will ever fail. You need to really let that sink in and believe it. Now, it's easy to sit here and listen to this radio broadcast, or it's easy to sit here when times are good and believe that. But what about when hardship comes your way? Do you still believe it? You see, I have in my life many times, I can fully admit, when things will start to happen and compile up on me, and it seems like everything's going the wrong way, and I try to hold on to my faith, and I do pretty good, but then another thing happens. Huh. I try to keep doing good and keep my faith, then another thing seems to happen. Right? And it seems like it just kind of compiles up, and sometimes my vision gets shaken. Sometimes I say, Yah, why are you letting this happen to me in my life? I have even am ashamed to admit that I have done this in front of my family who count on me to be their leader. When you're the leader, you must keep the straight and narrow. You must never, ever let your team your people see you shaken. You're supposed to be their, the rock for them, the image of Messiah that they can at least look up to. Now, men and people out there that, have, that you are following, when you're following these leaders, know that they are going to fail at some point in some time, that nobody living on earth is the Messiah. We all have that goal, but we are not the Messiah. So we will fall short. You know, hate to, hate to spoil it for you, but we will fall short. But the thing is, is that I have had those moments in my life that I felt this, that bit of wavering, I'll admit that, and yet I cry out to Yah, and honestly, in a matter of moments, it seems, something happens that completely changes the tide, changes the whole course into blessing. And I look back, and, and let me know if you share the same thought. I look back, and I'm like, wow, look how it all changed. I thought everything was going the other way. Man, I wish I would have kept the solid faith. You know, wouldn't have wavered a bit in front of my family. Or just in private, I wish I wouldn't have even have doubted for a second. Wouldn't that have been even more of an example that when those things came up, if I wouldn't have even let it get in on me? And I don't always just mean doubt where you think that Yah isn't going to come through for you, but I mean maybe you gripe, maybe you moan, maybe you squall, maybe you complain, maybe you bawl like a baby, I don't know, but maybe you just let a little bit of shaking going on, but when you get on the other side and now you can see clearly don't you wish you never would have had that little bit of doubt that you would have been the one that with all confidence said, it's just going to get better. Have faith in Yah. Yah will not forsake us. Yah won't forsake the righteous, righteous, and he never leaves their children begging for bread. But how many of you honestly can say, you know what, Teacher Eric, I've been there. I've been there myself. Where I should have kept the faith strong and said, 
I got Jesus. I don't know what they got, but I got Jesus. And I can overcome because with Yah, and we all know that Yeshua and Yah are one and the same, nothing shall be impossible. No word from him will ever fail. And that's why you got to get his word into your heart. Psalms 89, 34. My covenant, Yahweh says, I will not break. His covenant is his promise to his people, to you. Nor will I alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. The word of Yahweh will never fail. Numbers 23, verse 19 Elohim is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. That means change his mind. Oops, I made a mistake. I called it the wrong way. He hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and he shall not make it good? You can count on Yahweh. Man will fail. Man will lie, whether on purpose or inadvertently. It's all the same. Man will fall short. But Yahweh never will. No matter what you see with your eyes, no matter what you hear with your ears, no matter what you feel with your extremities, if any of that conveys the message to you that Yahweh has forsaken or he has forgotten or he has lied to you about his promises, know that you are being deceived. And at that moment, don't trust what you see, don't trust what you hear, don't trust what you feel. Trust the word of Yahweh and cling to his commandments for the word of Yahweh is a rock and the word of Yahweh was made manifest and the word of Yahweh is Yeshua HaMashiach the one that was commonly known to all of us as our first love Jesus Christ they may say that that is not his name they may say that you're calling on the devil when you say the name of Jesus they may say that there's no power in it but I remember my first love I remember the name that I cried out to when I was lost down and dirty I remember the name that I cried out to when I needed a miracle to work in my life I remember the name that I cried out to when I needed deliverance to take place and that name was Jesus Christ the Nazareth. And no matter how much I learn, no matter how much I study, no matter how many books I read, I don't care. The next teacher I hear come up and speak to me, the next great word of gospel, I'm never ever going to forget that. I'm not going to try to build up my faith through Gnosticism like these worldly people do. I'm going to come back to the elementary matters and I'm going to come back to the feet of Jesus Christ like a child, like he asked us to. Now I can remember reading in the word where Yama promised to bless you. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 2. It reads, And it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently, diligently, unto the voice of Yahweh thy Elohim, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Yahweh thy Elohim, this is what he promises, that Yahweh thy Elohim promises that I will set thee above all the nations of the earth, and that all the blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of Yahweh thy Elohim. Now those blessings might not come in the package that you think they need to come into. Those, pe- pa- those blessings might not show up at the exact moment that you think they ought to. But I tell you nonetheless, those blessings are coming and those blessings are there. 
You just need to sometimes realize what a real blessing is. Because Yahweh knows what you need before you even ask it. A blessing is what you need. Sometimes you try to change it into a blessing being what you want. A blessing to you is a new car. A blessing to you is $100 in your billfold. A blessing to you is a wife so beautiful, beautiful, everyone wants to gawk at her. A blessing to you is if you're so strong and physical that you're just a specimen, aren't you? Well, Yahweh doesn't look on the outwardly like men does. Yahweh looks right into the heart, and he sustains you with what you need. Believe me, every one of you that keeps these laws, statutes, and commandments are blessed. You may not think so, but Yahweh knows so. And Brother Ugly says, a purple cattle lack. See, we really got to get our focus straight. And we got to realize what a blessing is. Because if you sit around and you seek the things of this earth and you think that that's the blessings of Abraham, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss the true blessing and the peace and the love of the, what money cannot buy. You could have all the gold. And you could have all the cars. And you could have all the women. And you could be sitting on that pile of money. And if you didn't have bread of life to sustain you, you would die with that money in a clenched fist of starvation. Many people need to fast more. Because in fasting, the worldly flesh just seems to dissipate. I mean, how many, after multiple days of fasting, want to sit around and watch movies and immerse yourself in them? How many of you want to soak yourself in meaningless conversations and gossip after a few days of fasting? How many of you want to engage in senseless activities after a few days of fasting? How many want to go out and go shopping and go buy the next cool thing after many days of fasting, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? How all those things don't seem to matter that much anymore after a few days of fasting. But do you know what gets stronger? Do you know what you desire more? The relationship with Yahweh. How many of you now like to read the word of Yah while you're fasting? How many of you like to take time to pray more often when you're fasting, how many of you seem to find the time to cry out to the Father and sing praises to Him when you're fasting? I know that when we are fasting, especially corporately, we just love to get together and we're so connected to the Father. It's unbelievable how all that other stuff seems to fade away and you get everything in perspective and you can see what the real blessing is that man live not by bread alone but on that on every word of elohim so like i said yahweh promised to bless you now let's look at i want to show you an example of the prophet eliyahu elijah you see Elijah was a man of Yah. And when you read what he had gone through, it's what many of us have gone through. Yahweh sustained and blessed him magnificently. And he even had great power that wrought through him. Bringing back people back from the dead, calling down fire, doing many wonderful miracles. And yet, he even began to run sometimes in fear of Jezebel and Ahab. And yet, don't we all get a little bit clouded sometimes in what we do? We can read their acts and say, well, why didn't you just have a little more faith? Well, what about the things you go through? Sometimes you just have the littlest, mildest hiccup. You don't even have an entire kingdom knocking at your door trying to murder you. You could simply just have a problem at your job. You could simply have the boss yell at you for something you don't believe it's your fault. You could simply measure a board and cut it the wrong length and you think Yahweh forsook you. Keep things in perspective and remember, other people out there, you'll always find somebody that has it worse off than you do. And see, Yahweh told Elijah to go hide himself in the brook Sherith. And that is where Elijah drank by that brook 
and was sustained. And he ate by the ravens that brought him bread. And Elijah had predicted that this famine would come, and the famine was indeed coming upon the land. Now, most of you, including myself, if I'm going to be honest, would complain about this, the condition that Elijah was in, saying that they were cursed. Oh, here I am, drinking out of a stream, and what, the only thing I got to eat is what some ravens bring and drop at my feet? This is the life I've got, Yahweh, being your prophet and being your servant? It's because, I tell you, you look at blessings in the wrong way. Many people were beginning to starve to death and to die. Yet, Birds brought him food and sustained him. Some could call that a miracle. Elijah had all that he needed. And when the brook dried up from the famine, Yah sent him to a widow who also, she felt forsaken to die. She said so. She said that, well, you know, you know, Elijah goes and, and, and meets her at the well. And Yahweh told Elijah to go there, that there would be a widow there that would sustain him. So when he saw, he knew that that would be the widow. He, when he asked her what she's up to, he just says, well, I'm off to take the last bit of oil and the last bit of meal, and I'm going to make our, a couple of loaves. And me and my son are going to eat those loaves, and then we are going to die. Now, this woman believes in Yahweh, and we read that Yahweh will bless you if you keep the the commandments. And she said that she believes in Yah, then why does she think that Yahweh is going to forsake her? Because in times of hardship, saints, even though we love the Most High Yah, we forget we got Him and that He got us. I say again, we got Jesus. Who do they got? What gives her great faith? Well, when the prophet spoke these words, for the prophet said, For thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that Yahweh send rain upon the earth. And that is in 1 Kings seventeen fourteen. You see, she saved, she served the same Yah. And she had faith but that faith was being tested and elijah tested that by having her serve him first because it wouldn't have been that grave a thing really to her and her son eat first because she already planned that anyway and then she could have said and once we're done eating if there's enough left over prophet then we will serve you no you need to step out onto the water in great faith first and, and so if you were found into this predicament, right, you went and you made the lows for the prophet and he ate and you went back and there was more oil and more meal. And you're like, wow, look at the miracle. Yahweh didn't forsake me. He kept his promise by sending a prophet to me to keep what he promised in his word. Why did I ever doubt? Why did I let it enter into my mind that I was going to make the last two loaves of bread, eat that, and then my son and I were going to die? Wouldn't it have been better if I would have had the foresight and the true faith to proclaim the entire time while we're down to our last two loaves? Let's bake this off, and then it's gonna. let's see what Yahweh has in store for us next. And been excited about it. But she, just like many of us, was too close to the forest to see the trees. So sometimes you need to step back and realize that you got Jesus and that he's got you and that you won't be forsaken and that Yahweh will not lie and he will not give you anything impossible that you can't overcome in him. Check this out. Because that meal and that oil didn't run out. However, after some time passed by, her son got sick. And you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 17. And she goes to Elijah and she's really upset. Saying, well, did you, did, did Yahweh sustain us? 
just for my son to die? Like, what kind of cruel trick is this? And you think, woman, did you not learn to have faith that Yahweh's got you? And even if the life of your son is taken, he still got you in his blessing. You need to trust him. Because a lot of times, saints, we're not going to know why we went through certain things on this earth until the breath goes out of our body. But in the meantime, we can still be pillars and examples of the faith. We can be the light and we can be the salt. Things are going to happen in your life, good and bad. It rains on the just and the unjust. What separates you from them is the way you handle it. Do you handle the problems and the obstacles in your life with faith in Yah unwavering? Or do you always question? And do you always have a wavering stance? If so, you are not solid in your faith. And you need to turn back to the ways of Elohim. And you need to truly trust Him. Because Yah is going to try you to see, do you love me? Will you keep my commandments? And we look at life and death on this earth a whole lot differently than Yahweh does. See, we never go out of the sight of Yahweh, ever. We never go out of the sight of Yahweh ever. He knew us before he formed us in the womb. He knew us while we're in the womb. And he knows us out of the womb. And he knows us when we leave this earth. We never go out of his sight. The thing is, is we try to bring Yah a lot of times down into an earthly understanding. And so when we have a loved one that leaves our sight and we can't interact with them anymore, yeah, it's saddening to us. But we should have true belief that they're in the kingdom with the Father. We should have true belief that they're only sleeping, that they are not dead. And yes, we can ache that they're not in our presence. But again, we put so much on this life and death, meaning that if the breath goes out of someone's body, we automatically feel that Yah was forsaken and left us. There is many, many people in the Word, saints, didn't see it that way. And we need to get onto the same page that they're on. However, like a lot of us, this woman saw that her son was dead, that the life had left his body. There was no more breath in the body. And she cries out to Elijah, what's going on? And even Elijah himself cries out to Yah, saying to Yahweh, are you going to slay her son? But clearly Elijah doesn't believe that's going to happen. Because Elijah lays on the boy not once. He lays on the boy not twice. But he lays on the boy three times and he would have kept going until the life came back because he knew that he was there for a reason. And he knew that Yahweh was not going to take the life of this boy. And the life came back and the boy recovered. And the woman said, truly, I know now that you are a man of Yahweh. See, you've got to comprehend and understand, saints, that a lot of times when hardship comes our way and we want to give up, then if we would just fight on in faith, we could overcome. But then guess what? Another hardship comes. And we say, okay, that's enough. How many of you out there could raise your hand and say, I got enough faith to get me through one hardship. I might, not, I might even have enough faith to get me through two hardships. But if you have three hardships coming, I'm going to sit there and throw my hands up in the air at Yah and say, Yahweh, what is going on? Are you trying to slay me? How many of us can be honest with ourselves and say, yeah, you know what? I do behave like that. I can see why Elijah said the things he said, and I can see why the woman said the same things she said. But you got to remember, you need to keep on fighting. Everything we live through and overcome will make you stronger. It will make you stronger. When can you possibly be into a situation that when you go through these hardships, even though if you don't understand them, you can say, I got Jesus. I don't know who the world got, and I don't care, but I know who I got, and I got Jesus, and I can overcome. And when I get through this, even though I don't understand it, Jesus, I know you're going to carry me through. And I know that I will be stronger when I get to the other side. And then the next time another hardship comes my way, I'm going to be a little bit more calloused. Because I'm going to have the faith knowing I came through that. I never thought I could make it through. 
But I did. Because he will never give you any trial that you cannot overcome. The devil maybe will convince you that you can't overcome that trial, but he is lying to you. I have never, myself, the word says it, and I myself have never seen the righteous forsaken ever in my life. And there's been many things that I said, Yahweh, I don't know how you're going to do this. I can't see a way out. I cannot fathom making it safely to the other side, but I know you got me, Yahweh. And I know that I got you. And one way or another, we're going to make it. And when I get to the other side and I see how I overcame, what a day that's going to be, and I'm going to glorify your name. And then at that point, I can look back and I can have wisdom. That's how you need to pray. Because remember, every time you read about David, every time you read about Elijah, every time you read about Isaiah, every time you read about Peter, James, and John, remember, you serve the same Jesus. Remember, you serve the same Yahweh that they had. Remember, you have the same rock working through you that he gave to them to have miracles, signs, and wonders take place. So when you read all the things they came through, know that Yeshua Mashiach's got you and that you got him and that you can make it through it too. Yahweh fights for you. Deuteronomy chapter 20, 3 through 4. It reads, and shall say to them, hear, O Israel, Yahweh says, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For Yahweh your Elohim is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And it's easy to read that and go, hallelujah, Yah's got me. But what about when you're standing on that field of battle on the front line and you see the armies stre stretched out before you with their swords in hand, ready to cut you asunder? Can you say it then? Can you run full charge right into the eyes of that enemy and strike fear in their hearts because they see that there's no wavering in you at all? And they're like, wow, what in the world's going on? Because Israel, when they united like that, and they had the Ark of the Covenant with them, was where the presence of Yahweh is, and now that covenant is inside of you, that they would sound off together, and they would sound the shofar. And they would sound their voices. And it would be like thunder. And it would shake the ground that they walked on to where the armies would tremble in fear at the sound of the Israelites coming. Because there was no wavering and there was no fear at all. And in those times, they conquered and wiped out man, woman, and child of all their enemies. And then they would have a banquet in that midst. But in the times that they wavered, in the times that they feared, in the times that they second-guessed, in the times that their heart was faint, then in those times, that was the time that they wouldn't go up and fight. And then Yahweh wasn't with them. And when they went to go fight, when they said, oh, we're sorry, Yah, we made a mistake. And they went up in the battle. The prophet said, don't go up and fight now. Oh, it's far too late because Yahweh isn't with you. You can go, but you're going on your own. And what happens when something is a man that comes to not, does it not? And they would go up and they would try to take on these armies alone under their own manly, earthly power, and they would get slaughtered. But when Yahweh's with them, they would never be defeated. Know that. Know that. Know that. Know this is a spiritual battle. And when your mind is starting to fail you, and you're trying to grasp with the fog of your mind, and you want to overcome, but you just can't get it right in your head, when there's fear looking there, or anger, or anxiety, or doubt, or insecurities working, and you can't seem to shake it, 
Know that the enemies are standing out there around you. And through your earthly power, no, you are not going to overcome. But it's in that time you need to truly give yourself fully over to Yahweh and let him go out and fight those battles in your mind for you. Fight those battles that are working in your heart for you and overcome and reclaim your body as holy ground of the covenant of Yahweh the Elohim because you're a tabernacle of him. Allow him to put all these devils and demons on notice and serve them an eviction letter and get them out of his house. I think what happens is even though you call on the name of Yahweh, you're trying to do too much on your own. And don't get it twisted and messed up. Yes, you need to go and take the oil, and you need to take the meal, and you need to make the bread. You have to actually step out in faith and do something. You don't sit back and just try to miracle your way through deliverance and every single healing and think you don't have to do anything. How many times do we have in prayer prayer groups that you have people come up and you can tell they do not take care of their bodies whatsoever at all. They don't take care of them at all and they want to come and they say, my knees hurt. I got joint pain. My stomach's messed up. I got skin issues. And you can see that they clearly are just wanting a quick fix. Yah isn't your miracle drug. He doesn't work like that. He's not some sort of snake oil thing. That's the way of the world, Israel. No, Yahweh's going to try your heart to see are you in it. He's going to give you a task and see if you are faithful. And then when you are, he will reward you. The blessings are a reward. They're not just something to be stolen or taken like you so much think they, they are. Because it says, if you obey, if you obey, if you would obey my commandments, Then I will reward you. I will bless you. I will bless you then. The blessings, Israel, is just extra. You can either take them or you can leave them. The blessings are an extra. That's why it's a blessing. If someone gives you what you're owed, is that a blessing? No, you work for it. You're owed that. But when they give you more and up in abundance, that's a blessing. But again, a lot of times if you don't even realize what a blessing is, because you're not owed anything in this life. You're not owed a morsel of bread, and you're not even owed a drink of water. And <laughs> Think about that. You're not owed anything. So quit trying to operate in an entitlement mentality. Then maybe you'll have a little bit more grace and humbleness. And when you go out and you do by the work of your hands and Yahweh sustains and blesses you and you have these things that sustain your body, that is a blessing. You can glorify him and say, well, thank you, Father. And then when you have an abundance, isn't that a blessing to have an abundance? See, like I said, when we go back to this, there was a day that the dread and terror of our people would fall upon the nations as we would approach their borders, for they knew that Yalo Elohim was near and close to us and had proven through many victories that he would not forsake us. We need to have the devils on notice like that. Because you know that there was devils, we read in the, in the New Covenant, did we not? That when those people would go up and they saw how Paul cast out devils and they heard what Yeshua did, then they would go, hey, we just want to try to copy and paste this and do the same thing. And they said, oh, you know, Yeshua we know, Paul we know, but who the hell are you? And they beat the living clothes off of them till they ran out naked and the devils overcome them and stripped everything from them. And see, a lot of you are having the devil devils strip you naked and strip you bare. And you're calling out on the name of Yeshua and you're not getting delivered. And see, we need to come back into a perfect faith with Yahweh that the fear and dread of these demons would fall upon them when they can hear us marching up and coming to proclaim victory. When we come together at the feast, that's what it should be like in deliverance, where the demons are shaken and they're on notice. You know, if we're wrestling around with you on the ground for 15 minutes, that shows that you didn't do the painstaking task of getting yourself ready to be delivered. You weren't doing what it took. You're one of them that show up, and then you just want to be miracled into a deliverance. 
just like a lot of you eat whatever the heck you want. You won't exercise. You won't do anything to take care of your body, but you want your back pain miracled away. You want your leg pain miracled away. You want your gut um, problems miracled away. Or what about in other things in your life? You won't go out and work a job. You want to pick the thing you want to do, and then you want everyone to get together and pray for you to bless the work of your hands when it's not even what Yahweh wants you to do in the first place. Go out and work 10 jobs if that's what you need to do to put bread on the table. And the same thing in the deliverance, you need to be working on that daily. I'm going to have a teaching coming out that's going to talk about doing self-deliverance. Because self-deliverance can be extremely beneficial. It should never take the place of deliverance with like-minded believers. However, self-deliverance, I've had unbelievable, some of the best deliverance I've had was through self-deliverance. Again, it never takes the place of deliverance with other, with other saints because they can see things working in you that you can't see, and there's power in numbers. Don't ever forget that. But it's that, just that time with you and Yeshua HaMashiach that you can search your inward parts and deliver you of these demons that have had excellent deliverance. And also, if you are not delivered, you will prepare yourself for deliverance. When I go to be delivered with Israel, I don't have all those problems that you seem to all have problems with where you're wrestling around for 15, 20, and 30 minutes every single time to be delivered. Can there be some demons that only come out by prayer and fasting? Yes. Can there be some demons that are deep-rooted and it just takes a little bit? Yes. But when it's every single time that you have issues getting a devil out, that's because you're not doing the work to get your ground ready and you're leaving legal ground for the enemy. You're leaving footholds for the enemy in your life and there's nothing we can do to break that. Yeshua HaMashiach, in the land that he went back to, could not wrought many miracles when he went back to his home country because they said, we know your mother, we know your father, we know who you are. What makes you think that you're the son of Elohim that can do all these miracles? It says, because of their lack of faith, even the son of Elohim, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yah himself, could not do miracles and wonders there because of their unbelief. But yet you want us to miracle you. So now you have a little bit of opportunity, you out there hearing this, to get yourself ready for the feast when you come to be delivered. You need to be working on that. Now, and I've heard so many times people say it. That's why I'm spending time on this right now, because somebody out there right now needs to hear this, that they say, I just can't wait till the feast gets here, or I just can't wait till next Shabbat, or I just can't wait till this pastor, teacher, preacher, deacon, elder, um, brother, whoever gets here, because when he does, oh, we can all get delivered. Oh, we're all going to get set free. Well, obviously, you don't believe that you serve the same Jesus they do. You believe that the miracles and signs and wonders are just for them. It didn't say that the miracles, signs, and wonders are just for pastors. It didn't say that the miracles, signs, and wonders are just for teachers, elders, deacons, apostles, evangelists. It didn't say that. It says that the miracles, signs, and wonders are for them that believe. We got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. So David, let's go into him. Let's talk about him for just a minute. His faith. Because we just talked about Elijah and what we saw there, right? Let's talk about David. There, there was a young man that Yahweh chose above all to be king of Israel. The young man, this young man, he watched over his father's sheep. And there was many sheep. Yet, when a lion came and snatched just one ewe out of the flock, David didn't make excuses, did he? He didn't try to justify what just occurred, saying, well, my father has many sheep, and the enemy came in and he just got one. He didn't say, well, look, it's already taken place, it's already happened. Like Next time I'll be more vigilant, next time I'll watch. But the lion already got the sheep. I'm not, I'm not going to risk my life going after the lion. The lion already got the sheep. The sheep's probably dead anyway. Did David say any of those things? Or did David say that he went after the lion? That he faced fear? And did he grab that lion by the mane and he slew it? You know, you really have to start to ask yourself, whatever leader you are and whatever capacity you're in, 
Is that the way that you view the sheep that you're over? When they go out, when the enemy snatches one of them, do you become angry at them, at the fact they got snatched? Did David blame the sheep? Did David say, well, that sheep should have known better? That sheep should have hearkened and stayed in with the other sheep? But that damn sheep is always wandering off. I'm glad that sheep got taken. That sheep deserved it. You didn't hear any of that, did you? David didn't make excuses for why the sheep got snatched. David didn't make excuses to leave the sheep. David simply went after the sheep without hesitation and faced whatever he had to in order to bring it back. And if that sheep wasn't going to be brought back alive, that lion wasn't going to live to eat it. Did you hear what I said? If that sheep would have gotten taken, David would have still made sure that he slayed the enemy to preserve the other sheep. Because if he leaves the lion out there and goes, oh, well, the sheep's already dead, so I'm not going to go up and face that lion. Well, couldn't the lion come back and get the other sheep? When you're a leader in any capacity, you need to remember this. You need to remember when your sheep get taken out that you don't make excuses. Look, that brother or that sister never did listen. They were always eating off of their tables. They always had a problem with this, that, and the other. They deserve what they get. I'm going to send them off and, and pray that Yahweh brings curses on them, that, that, that I'm handing them over to Satan, that they may come back. Or do you go out after them to their physical location and look them in the eye or reach out to them the best that you can in whatever shape, fashion, and form that you can and say, brother or sister, what's the issue? We need you back. We need to bring you back alive. And if that brother and sister, hear me, Israel, if that brother and sister is hard in their heart and they're gone and they won't listen to you, you still slay the enemy. Then that's when you come back and you make an example of it to preserve the other sheep that they're not taken in by that deception. So you slay the enemy and you kill him. But please see if you can bring the sheep back alive. Yes, your father has many sheep, but he cares so much about the one that was lost. David gave us a great example. And so when a bear came, well, David did likewise. as what he did to the lion. He didn't complain to Yah saying, Yahweh, now wait a minute. Why is this happening to me? He didn't say, forget it. I'm not going out after another lamb and risking my life. I don't even get paid to do this. Look, if my dad wants these sheep preserved, then my dad can come out and watch these sheep. How many of us treat the spiritual sheep like that? How many of us, in any leadership capacity whatsoever at all? And remember, women, you are heads over the children and younger women. So how many of us in any leadership capacity of all say that? Father, you deal with them. I'm tired of dealing with them. Father, if you want them to be preserved, you do it. Or maybe David should have went and got one of his brothers off the battlefield and said, hey, I know you're busy, but can you come back because I can't handle my job and I need you to come in and do it. Can you go back and get the sheep? Because I'm sick of this. First it was a lion. My goodness, now a bear? Are you serious? No, David handled his job. David didn't make excuses. David got the job done. And Yahweh backed David. So, when the bear came, he didn't make all these excuses or say why this is happening to me. Or he didn't say, I'm not risking my life. He marched right out there without a second thought and he slew the bear too. Because he already had the confidence. And see, that's why we have to look at this. Don't look at things as another problem and another problem and another obstacle. Look at it as another solution and to becoming a better servant of Messiah. Look at it as another way to become stronger. See the value in it instead of always seeing the negative in it. So when he faced that lion and he had the faith and overcame the lion, he had the confidence, wow, I can do this. A bear, I got you too. Come on, bring a pack of wolves. I got you too. What you got, devil? Because it isn't me that's doing it. It's the he that is in me that is greater than you that's doing it. 
So when are you going to start looking at trials and tribulations, not as overbearing mountains of heartache and failure, but as opportunities to step up and walk in the victory that Yahweh has for you? No matter the outcome. This is what you really got to hear. No matter the outcome, Yah is in control. And you need to walk in Him if you want to become stronger in your faith. And be a brother or a sister that he can use for his divine will. You ask to be used by Yah. I know you do. I know that many of you want to be used by Yahweh in some capacity or another. You want to be an example to your brothers and sisters. You want people to be able to look at you and to glean off you. I know a lot of you, especially you men, you want that. Deep down, you want to lead. It's in the small things that Yahweh is trying to build you up into your leadership position, whatever that position is. Whether it's you're a sheep herder out on the field or whether it is that you are suited up on the front line for battle or whether it's that you are a woman that is guarding her home and rearing the children and making sure that they're taken care of. Whatever capacity that you're in, you need to do it to the best of your ability. And you know that you want to become stronger and stronger. So in these little things that you see them as little, Yahweh is just building you up to take on that giant. He's building you up that he can use you. See, David's faith grew. First Samuel 17 verse 36 says, thy servant slew, this is David speaking, okay? David is speaking to uh, King Saul. And he says, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living Elohim. So if David would have chickened out on the lion, or say he would have taken the lion, but then he just got fed up and didn't want to take the bear. If any one of those obstacles he didn't fight his way through, he would not have been prepared for the giant. David had to do those things to be able to be used of Yahweh to conquer the giant, to set his people free. And even in that, David takes five stones in his sling, which he had already battle-proven, when he went to face the giant. So he didn't go in ignorant, ill-prepared. No, he practiced and he became a marksman with the sling. And when King Saul said, take my armor, take my sword, you're going to need these things. And David, I know that you don't have them because you're not a man of war like we are. So let me bless you with them before you go face this giant. David put them on and he goes, I haven't proven these things. I haven't tested these things. I'm not going to go out like some jackass into battle facing that ill-prepared. I'm going to go with what I know and what has got me through. And that's what I want for each and every one of you. You need to fall back on your first love, Jesus Christ, and say, I got Jesus. Who you got, devil? I got Jesus. Who you got? Fall back on your first love. Don't let anybody try to disarm you. And how many times do you hear these new doctrines or these new ways of speech that they say that you're English or you're Spanish or you're German or you're French or you're Czechoslovakian isn't good enough. You need to speak in the Hebrew, broken, Aramaic, whatever gibberish language that's working today. You have to use that and twist your tongue in such a way to gain a performance. How many of you try to wear that armor into battle and it hasn't been proven and you don't have the confidence you need? In those times, you need to go back, Israel, to your first love, the love that you had that got you through when you were lost and then you became found, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, when David went out to fight this devil, Goliath mocked David's appearance and told him he wasn't strong enough. He wasn't good enough. And what does it mean about me that you view me as a dog, Goliath said, that you would send sticks out against me? He viewed David as a weakling, as a little twig. And do you think that that let David get shaken? Do you not know that there will be mockers in the last day? How many of your family members have mocked you? 
How many people at your jobs mock you when you stand up in front of their face and you guard the commandments and they always got some mouthy ass stuff to say? Always got some mocking word, don't they? Always have to put their tongue against you. How many of you start to feed into that and let doubt creep in? Or let your confidence be swayed to the left or to the right? David stood in the face of the enemy, right looking into his eyes. And he wouldn't let that mocking sway him. 1 Samuel 17, 46-47 reads, This day, David said, right to that devil, Yahweh delivered thee into my hand, and I will smite you, and I will take your head from you, and I will give the carcass of the host to the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is an Elohim in Israel, and that all this assembly shall know that Yahweh saves not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hands. And then David went out, battle proven, battle ready, prepared, and he conquered that enemy with one stone to the head as it sunk in and knocked Goliath dead to the ground. And it said the stone sunk into his head. That David threw the stone, but the power of Yahweh pushed the stone. And conquered that devil. And he took his head from him. And just like David saved the sheep in his father's field. He came out and he saved the sheep of Yahweh. Many thousands and thousands that day. From the mouth of Goliath. And he grabbed him by the mane. And he cut off his head. David had great faith. Yet he did not take the king's battle armor which he had not proven and tested. He did not go out empty-handed either, but he grabbed the five stones in the sling, which he used many times and was proficient with. We got Jesus. And we need to go into every battle and every day prepared for victory. Hit your knees every morning and gather your stones, Israel, and gather your sling for war. I'm not the man that David was. I'm working to be. I'm trying to go past David and work to be like Yeshua. So, you know, I need to gather just one more stone than five. I'm going to gather six stones. Gather the stone of truth. I'm going to reach down and I'm going to gather the stone of righteousness. I'm going to gather the stone of peace and the stone of faith. I'm going to take hold of that stone of salvation. And then I'm going to put the stone of the spirit in my sling. And there's nothing, I'm telling you, nothing on this earth that is going to stop me because I go into battle with Yeshua fighting for me. And of course, I'm speaking of Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 17, the armor of Elohim. You must have this armor that is battle proven, not like the earthly armor of Saul that was not battle proven, Israel. You must have Yahweh's heavenly armor. And you must battle prove that armor. You don't go out into your daily walk here, you know, to your job or to whatever it is. You just don't face life in general without hitting your knees first and battle proving that armor. And every time that you conquer in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, you battle try that armor one more time and one more time and one more time. It's tried and it's tested. Know where your strengths and your weaknesses are. Many keep the armor of Elohim in a closet, never to be taken out, until the devil kicks in their front door, and then it's too late. Go after the lion, Israel. Go after the bear, so you can gain the victories needed to increase your faith to behead the giant. Israel, I I got something on my heart that I really think I need to give you just one more here. Why don't you all hit a seven for me real quick. Let me know that you're tracking with what I'm saying. Let me know that you're seeing that there is areas, yes, teacher, that that I need to work on, that I need to get battle proven in. I can tell my armor is getting a little rusty. I can tell my armor is getting a little bit of dust on it. Then I need to get that armor out. 
And I need to battle try that armor. I need to collect my smooth stones off the ground. And be prepared as David was prepared to go into battle. So I don't have the devil kick in my front door. And I'm sitting there unarmed like, oh, now I better run and figure something out. Now I better run down to the store and get armed. Just wait right here. I mean, how many thieves would do that, right? We're getting a whole lot of sevens. Glory to the king. We're getting a whole lot of sevens. How many thieves would do you that? A thief kick in your door and you say, oh, 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 I, I didn't know that tonight's tonight. Could you just wait right there? I'm going to run to my room and load up my Glock. I got to get out of the safe, find my bullets. I'll be right back. So if you could just wait right here by the door, I'll be back in a minute to shoot you in the head, okay? The devil isn't going to wait on you either. You need to be proactive, saints. Reactive gets people killed. Now I want to show you, when you say you got Jesus, you must believe it. And you're going to face a lot of heartache. And I can't imagine what a greater heartache could be for a mother and father than losing a child. That's a great heartache. It's really hard when you lose a brother or a sister, is it not? And like I said, we view death, even though we try to say we don't view death as a permanent thing, we tend to still act like it, don't we? Second Samuel chapter 12, 20 through 23. Second Samuel chapter 12, 20 through 23. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. And if some of you, you know, to, to help get you on board, if you're like, well, okay, David's this arising from the earth and he's washing and he's anointing himself. He's changing his clothes. Well, why was he down on the, on the ground? Why was he all dirty? Why didn't he need to go get clean? What's, what's going on? Well, see, David committed murder and adultery. And the prophet Nathan came in and he rebuked Nathan. I mean, he rebuked David. And David was convicted. And Nathan said, you know, because you took what didn't belong to you, Yahweh's going to take the son that comes from that union between you and Bathsheba. Oh, you'll stay together and you'll go on to have other sons. But this son, I'm going to take. And David pleaded, Yahweh, don't take him and some of you saints should mark down and go back and read second samuel chapter 12 because if you want to know how to pray for somebody how many of us out there you know a saint requests prayer and you really want to see a breakthrough and so every night before you go to sleep or you know if you happen to think about it you'll say you know uh, bless brother so-and-so and and you know, i hope that you're there for him i know i expect you to be there for him father and and heal him in this and heal him in that uh make a breakthrough you know make a way bless him father bless him and that's it. But when you see David, he fasted. David got down on the earth and threw the dust in his face. David wept and David cried day after day after day after day. David never gave up. Some people would say that's doubting, David. You, you've already asked. Yahweh knows what you need. You don't need to keep asking. That's a lack of faith. Well, David didn't see it that way. A man after Yahweh's own heart. David prayed day after day after day. And then the child died. And the servants came and they told David that the child died. And then at that point, David rose up from the earth and he washed and he anointed himself. And he changed his apparel. And he came into the house of Yahweh. And I want to take it slow. Did, did he go into the house of Yahweh and curse Yah? Or maybe he went down to the bar and cracked open a bottle of Blue Label. Maybe he said, you know what, Yah, I just need to take a break for a while. And I just need to get away from it all. Because I don't know why you did this thing, or I know why you did it, but I don't understand it. Or I know why Anna understand, but I'm just not happy about it. No, David went in and he worshipped. He just didn't go and, you know, say a prayer. He didn't go and make an appearance. He worshipped Yahweh immediately following him hearing his, about his son's death. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they sat bread before him and he ate. And his servant said unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou did fast and weep for the child while your child was still alive. 
But when your son died, you rose up and you eat? And he said, well, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can I tell whether Elohim will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now that my child is dead, why should I fast anymore? Can I bring him back again through the fasting? Can I bring him back again through the crying and the weeping? Can I bring him back? Many of you cannot rest assured on Yahweh's decisions. When Yahweh makes a decision, Israel, it's final. It was final with David. It was final with Moses. And it's going to be final with you. You're going to have to get that through your thick head. And I'm speaking to myself too. When Yahweh makes a decision in the declaration, it is final. It is over. And this wasn't an unexpected death either. He knew that this was coming. But why would I fast? Because I can't change anything. I will go to him. So David knew that he'd be reunited with his son, but he shall not return to me. Will you stand for Yeshua, no matter the cost, Israel? Will you stand for Jesus, no matter the cost? I know, again, we all say we will, right? You know, I know a man, Israel, that stood for Yah, no matter the cost. And he would not forsake Yah no matter what. No matter how much pressure came upon him by the world, the government, by the authorities, by his friends or people that he was, became close to, he wouldn't forsake Yah for nothing. And that man was thrown into the lion's den. Yahweh sent an angel to close the mouth of the lions and that man he was saved. Yahweh then in turn brought judgment on his enemies. And the wickedness they sought for him, they fell to their families themselves. And they and their wives and children were killed by the lions eaten alive. Daniel chapter 6. Now, Daniel saw that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was their, the, the names that were put on them. But he saw how they persevered through the fiery furnace. He knew that Yah would save him, correct? Do you think that's the only reason that he went into the lion's den, Israel? Do you think that the only reason that Daniel stepped foot into that lion's den was that he knew for out a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh would see him through safely? Well, why, why, do we, why should we think that? The word doesn't tell us that. I say it's that Daniel was confident in his Yah and knew that he had Yah and that Yah had him. And no matter the outcome, it would be Yahweh's will. And that no matter the outcome, Yahweh would use it for his glory. And Daniel would make sure that Yahweh's name through Daniel's actions would always be glorified throughout history no matter what the outcome was. I know of a woman that no matter the cost stood for Yahweh. I know a woman that no matter what the government brought upon her shoulders, no matter what the authorities brought, no matter the threats that they made on her family and her seven sons, that she would not forsake Yah. And in this case, each one of her sons was brutally murdered before her eyes. And each one of her sons proclaimed their faith in Yahweh with their last dying breath. Including their mother, who never wavered. And she did nothing but encourage each one of her sons the whole way through as they were being mutilated as they were being slaughtered and cut up and even cooked into a, in a kettle. Gruesome. It's hard enough to watch a son die. I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't even imagine. But to see your son brutally murdered and skinned alive and tortured in front of you. How horrific. And to see your son or daughter glorify Yahweh the whole way through. That's something that an angel can't even do. 
It's unimaginable what great faith that would take on both the mother and the sons. Her life, in the end, was taken too. Yahweh then brought the judgment that they put on that family. He brought upon their heads. And he slaughtered that king. Second Maccabees, chapter 7. Israel, a lot of us have courage. I really want you to hear me, okay? I really want you to hear me. A lot of us have courage to say we will die for Yahweh until the first one of us does. I really believe that's worth saying again. A lot of us have courage to say we will die for Yah. We will give our life for Jesus until the first one of us does. Then we default to, why have you forsaken us, O Yah? We have confidence and faith in Him as long as Yahweh performs in the manner that we think He should. Because when you see the first one die, now it's getting real. Wait a minute. I thought that Yahweh was going to sweep in a mighty wind. I thought Yahweh was going to bring in an angel and stop all of this. I just saw my brother have the life taken out of their body. Because Yahweh doesn't perform the way that you think he should, it doesn't mean that he's performing the way he shouldn't. However, Yah says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Isaiah 55 verse 8. In both examples, Israel, in Daniel chapter 6 and in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, I gave and showed that the faithful stood for Yah and they put everything on the line for him. One lived and the others did not in this life. Both will go on to a life everlasting. Both their testimonies are written down in the annals of time to increase our faith and to glorify Yahweh's great name. In both accounts, His name was risen up and glorified. We got Jesus, Israel. I'm going to end on this, so I really need you to hear me. We got Jesus. And Jesus has you. We need to start acting like it. You jump up and down and you praise Yahweh on your own two feet. But can you praise Him even louder from a wheelchair? You can praise Yah in the birth of a child. But can you praise Yahweh in the death of one? You can stand for Yahweh when He preserves you and you see your brothers and sisters overcome in this realm. Will you stand for Yahweh just the same when you see the life go out of their body for their king? You are the light and you are the salt of the earth. And in you, Israel, his name is glorified. You all, I said, you all have an amazing testimony for Yahweh. And do you know what that testimony is? It is your life. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man... His days are as of grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall it no more be. Psalms 103, 14 through 16. Your life is real for but a moment. You're going to experience a lot of things in this life. Some will feel good to you, some will feel bad. As long as you're serving Yahweh, your king, you got to know that it's all going to be for his glory. There's one key difference. Will you raise his name to greatness? Will you live a life that's a testimony? Will you praise him when you feel low? Will you praise him when you're going through suffering? Will you praise him when you think that you're not dealt a fair hand? Or will you always look And try to compare yourself among yourselves, which you're not supposed to do. And say, how come is it that my brother and sister has it so much better off than I do? I know of someone that got stricken with a disease in their 60s. And they couldn't walk anymore. 
and they worked hard their whole life, and they get to an old age, and they can't enjoy their retirement years, and they're chair-ridden. And this person glorifies Yahweh, and he praises the name of Jesus. People would say to him, how can you still glorify Yahweh when you can barely even, you know, take care of going to the bathroom yourself, when you could barely feed yourself? He's like, well, I got to walk and to run and to dance for 60 years. Some don't get to do that at all. Some only can do that for three years or four. And their life is either taken from them or they're paralyzed at a young age or they're come from the womb this way. Yahweh gave me 60 years to do these things. Life isn't how you look at it. Start looking at it. You got Jesus. How will you live and how will you use the life that Yahweh gave you? That's the question. We got Jesus. Who you got. I love you, Israel. Glory to the King. You stay strong. You work hard this week. You think about these things and you meditate them on day or night. We got a feast coming up. And whereas we're preparing for the Feast of Trumpets, just get in your heart that you want to come to his feast in the right frame of mind. And as we prepare to, you know, go through the Day of Atonement, to go through the Days of Purification, and come to the Feast of Ingathering, which is one of the three feasts where we all appear together, that you come together in the right heart, in the right spirit, that you'll come with battle-proven armor, that you'll come ready for war and that we can be like our ancient people was where we can march together so strong that the earth quakes and the sky rumbles with the thunder of our voice as we scream out Hosanna 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 to the king and the devils are in fear because they know our king he is coming bless you Look at him looking.